It is my great pleasure to now introduce today's speaker. Bridget Stetchbury is a professor in the Department of Biology at York University in Toronto. She did her MSc at Queen's University and her PhD at Yale and was a postdoctoral fellow at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, DC. Since the 1980s, she has studied migratory songbirds to understand their behavior, ecology, and conservation, but has also witnessed firsthand the shocking declines of many birds, including the wood thrushes, barn swallows, and bobolinks. She studies the absolutely incredible migration journeys of songbirds and the many threats that they face on those journeys. She is president of the Board of Wildlife Preservation Canada, whose mission is to prevent animal extinctions. She is the author of two books, Silence of the Songbirds and the Bird Detective, and was featured in the award-winning documentary, The Messenger. I will now hand over the screen to Professor Stetchbury, who will talk to us about new developments in the study of bird migration. Welcome everyone. It's a privilege to be here to talk to you today about my favorite subject. Of course, fall migration is, uh, is on. I've been enjoying seeing the warblers passing through my yard and saw a couple of female scarlet tanagers yesterday feeding on some fruit trees. Um, and so today I'm going to share screen, um, of course, and show you my PowerPoint slide. And I think uh, it works best, uh, as everyone said, to have your video off. And also, if you don't mind holding your questions till the end of the talk, uh, I've got nothing scheduled after this. Um, and so um, I'll be around for questions for plenty of time. And uh, you can jot down your questions so you don't forget them uh, at the end. So let's get into this. I'll share my screen. That out of the way. And there we go. So yeah, um, the last decade or so has been a really, really exciting time to be somebody studying songbird migration. I've been studying songbirds since I was a graduate student. So that goes early when an undergraduate researcher going back to 1984. Um, but it's, at all this time, it's only been in the last 10 years or so that we've been able to actually track songbirds because they're so small in body size. In order to put a tracking device on them, you need a device that's really tiny that weighs uh, one and a half grams or less. And why do we want to know about songbird migration? Well, as a behavior, it's just absolutely fascinating that little tiny birds, no bigger than your hand, um, know somehow, genetically speaking, how to fly from Canada to Central America or South America and how to get back again. Um, young songbirds are born with this knowledge. They don't follow their parents. It's completely innate. Uh, and so really um, this mass movement of birds that we see this time of year um, is a natural phenomenon that's unprecedented around the world. It's just phenomenal what these birds can do and the sheer numbers, hundreds of millions of birds pour out of Canada this, kind of, this time of year uh, and head south. But the journey can be very dangerous. We know that only about half of the birds survive the round trip. And even before humans built cities and cut down forests, it was probably a dangerous trip just by the sheer distances traveled, the different kinds of habitats birds uh, have to tra traverse through. Uh, and for young birds uh, on their first maiden voyage, their first trip, um, of course they have to learn as they go uh, what the dangers are. So you imagine a Wilson's warbler, like, I, like you can see here that breeds across um, the boreal forest of Canada, it may breed in an intact forest if it's lucky, and down here in Central America, it may be lucky enough to be wintering in say northeastern uh, Nicaragua, which is largely forested, but it still has to get back and forth. And this main migration route, I'll show you some maps in a minute, going down the Eastern seaboard through places like Toronto here, New York City, Washington DC, we have built cities upon cities upon cities in their way. And where there aren't cities, for instance, some places along the US Gulf Coast, we have converted what used to be um, coastal forest into agricultural lands. And so humans no doubt have had a huge impact on these migration journeys and the success of individuals, both in terms of being able to stay healthy while they're traveling and even just survive the trip in the first place. So, Starting back around 2009, uh, it was absolutely impossible to track migratory songbirds. 
over any distance at all. Uh, and, you know, at that time, we just thought it would always be impossible. Never in my wildest dreams did I think that I would be the one to come across the technology that would allow us to get start to finish migration maps on individual songbirds. Um, this happened in collaboration with the British Antarctic Survey, who had developed these devices, I'll talk about these in a minute, called geolocators, um, which estimate position based on sunrise and sunset times. And in 2009, we were able to produce and publish the first ever in the world migration maps. Uh, this one happen, happens to be of a purple martin, where for an individual bird, you know the date at which it left, the date which it arrived at its wintering grounds. You can draw on a map the approximate route of travel. You can see this bird crosses the Gulf of Mexico in the fall in blue and also in the spring in red. We'd never before been able to get this kind of information on individual birds. Along came another tracking technology, which I'll talk about a little bit as well today, um, that involves traditional radio tracking. We've been able to radio track animals like radio collaring caribou and bears and tagging uh, birds of various kinds for a long time. Uh, but this only works over short distances. Uh, what they've done is to build, build an amazing system, a network of receiver towers, especially in Southern Ontario, but now they're, they're blanketed all over the Eastern US and Southeastern Canada. And when you radio tag a bird, if it happens to fly near a tower, it's detected automatically. So if you have enough towers, you can piece together what your birds are doing on migration. And then very soon after that, in 2015, came uh, the standard GPS technology. Normal GPS tracking devices are two or three or four grams, are quite big and too big for a songbird. But they were able to miniaturize these to the size of a dime. Sorry, this should be a Canadian one. Um, uh, and so that you could put them on larger songbirds. And the advantage of these GPS devices is you get the exact location of that bird at that particular time. So these, you can see how these suite of new technologies just, just uh, swept through the research world uh, and um, hundreds and hundreds of papers have been published in the last decade using these different technologies and not just making maps of what birds do, but answering important questions about what happens to them, what affects them on migration and what those threats are. So these geolocators, I'll just explain this uh, very briefly and we can talk more about it uh, later. Basically they're light sensors. So they're, they're archival devices. All the data is stored here in the, in the main body. And there's a little light sensor at the end of the antenna. And this geolocator sits on the bird's back with the antenna sticking out towards the tail so that the light can hit it. And essentially, it's the technology is so simple that what it records is light levels. So when you look at the raw data, quite literally, you can see it looks like this. It's dark, light level is low. Suddenly, the light level increases, that's sunrise. It stays bright all day, and then suddenly it decreases and gets dark, that's sunset. So by knowing the time of the sunrise or the time of the sunset, you can figure out longitude. Of course, the sun comes up earlier in Ottawa than it does in Toronto, than it does in Vancouver. So that's pretty straightforward. To get latitude, north and south, uh, you look at day length because the day length changes as you go north and south and it changes over the course of the year. And so we know what the day, sunrise and sunset and day length is just about everywhere on the planet on every day of the year. So you can match up what the bird is experiencing in its travels and infer where it must be. So if you were to look up sunrise and sunset time for this example on the 4th of May in 2007, you would find that this geolocator was in Toronto because it was on the roof of my biology building where I was trying them out and uh, experimenting with these for the first time. The first study, I'm going to talk about four different studies today, uh, wood thrushes, purple martins, white crowned sparrows, and red-eyed vireos, to give you a flavor of the types of questions uh, we can now answer about uh, songbird migration. And so we'll look uh, just at a couple of examples of um, what kind of information you can get from geolocators. So you can see there's a wood thrush male feeding his young, and you can see his little backpack on here. 
Um, they, they, we have really good return rates with these. The birds uh, are wearing them all summer as they're feeding young and fledging young, and then they molt and then they begin migration. They don't really seem to notice that they're carrying this extra baggage. But what we were able to do for my study site, which is here in Northwestern Pennsylvania, it's just across the lake from Long Point, uh, is to tag birds at the breeding site. And then when they come back the next year, we have to catch them, take the device off, download the data, and then make the maps that I'm going to show you. So the bird, in order to get any information, the bird has to survive the trip and then come back with the data. So for instance, this is a typical uh, trajectory of a wood thrush from our population. Uh, most of them winter here in either eastern Honduras or northern Nicaragua. And this is the estimated location. This bird would have arrived the 1st of November and stayed on its tropical wintering grounds until the 21st of April. And we know it left on the 21st of April because suddenly it flew over here to the Yucatan where it spent a few days. Then it flew across the Gulf of Mexico and raced up the Mississippi River Valley and was back in Pennsylvania on the 3rd of May. And so we, we actually have a bit more information than this, but this sort of simplifies uh, where we can sort of estimate the stopover locations along in here in the US and uh, the general route that it's taking. We were surprised to find a lot of variation among individuals. So although this is the standard route, some birds did some things a little bit differently. So here's another one, a female in this case, was again wintering in the same sort of area. It left on the 27th of April, went up to the Yucatan, and you might think, okay, it's gonna go across the Gulf for whatever reason, and we don't know, she went around the Gulf of Mexico. So by the 18th of May, when most of our birds are already back in Pennsylvania, she was on the Mexico-US border and didn't get back home till the 26th of May. So we don't really understand uh, why some birds are doing something so very different. We tracked this bird again the next year and it did go across the Gulf of Mexico. So individuals have some of that flexibility um, to take one route in one year and a different route in the next year. Why were we tracking wood thrushes? Well, I had done radio tracking studies on them before, so I knew that they could carry these tags and they're, they're pretty heavy birds. They weigh over 40 grams on average, so they can um, carry these backpacking devices. But really our motivation was the shocking decline of wood thrushes uh, that I'm sure most of you have experienced in your lifetime if you, if you have the good fortune to go and be near the forest on a regular basis or have forest in your yard. Um, the breeding bird survey has shown a dramatic decline in wood thrushes on these systematic surveys that they do across North America. And so of course, uh, if we want to stop birds from declining, we have to have some idea of what the threats are that they face. Is it on the breeding grounds? Is it on migration? Is it on the wintering grounds? Because I had done quite a lot of work in the tropics, uh, I wanted to understand what role tropical deforestation played in causing these declines that we can count and measure on the breeding grounds. But in order to do this, we have to know where particular populations go in the wintertime. And before we had tracking devices in 2009, there was no way, absolutely no way to pinpoint where a particular breeding population spends the winter. So we don't know what threats they're facing there because we don't know where they're going. So we launched, um, a, a geolocator tracking study with collaborators and the stars that you see here that are color coded represent the different sites where we attach geolocators. The red one is my Pennsylvania study site, but I had a student, Garth, that was studying um, wood thrushes in Ontario and our collaborators were doing work here in Vermont and in Maryland and in South Carolina and here, I think that's Indiana. Um, and so we were curious where different populations spent the winter. And you can see shown in gray here in panel B, the gray is what we understand to be the entire winter range of the wood thrush. So anywhere from Southern Mexico down to Panama. We were surprised to find that a given breeding population doesn't just spread out over the whole wintering grounds. They have a fairly small region where they go. So let's look at our Pennsylvania birds shown in red here. They are clustered very heavily in Nicaragua, which is right here, and Eastern Honduras. Hardly, almost none of them will be found in the Yucatan or farther south in Panama. So although the winter range stretches from Mexico to Panama, uh, our 
Pennsylvania birds, and in fact, all the birds from Ontario, Vermont, Maryland, they focus their wintering grounds on a much, much smaller area than the entire winter range. Their survival, their population size is dependent on the forests in these two countries. When we looked at the birds from farther west, you can see they go to a different spot. Very few of them uh, went here to the Eastern Central America. Most of them are in the Yucatan and in Guatemala. And so here we have this uh, kind of like a parallel migration system where the Eastern birds stay east as they go down to the tropics and the more Western ones stay to the west. And so what's affecting population declines in Eastern wood thrushes are gonna be different depending on the forests in Central America than what's affecting the ones in the Yucatan. So this in itself was really surprising because you know, these birds are traveling you know, over th thousands of kilometers to get from North America to Central America. And yet their wintering grounds, which are physically separated are, are only a few hundred kilometers apart. So they're, they're certainly capable of flying that distance. It's just they have this sort of innate destination, uh, east versus west. Now that we know where the wintering sites are, we can go and see what's happening uh, to the forest there. So remember that the central eastern, like the eastern populations of wood thrush really like Nicaragua. So we can look at what's happened to the forest there and these colors show the percentage forest loss in just five years from 2000 to 2005. And this is determined from remote sensing. And the red shows areas with more than 15% forest loss in those little pixels in just five years. So red and orange are really bad and yellow is pretty bad too. And you can see, unfortunately, for our Eastern populations of wood thrushes, uh, their core most important wintering area is just being hammered by deforestation. It's one of the highest rates of deforestation in the world. For the birds that were from the Southeast, you can see this Northern Guatemala area and the Southern Yucatan, sort of in Belize in here, that area is also under heavy, heavy deforestation. So it's really no wonder that we see these steep population declines if the amount of forest cover that the population depends on has shrunk and shrunk. We can see this uh, here in the bottom panel for Nicaragua, again, one of the, the core wintering areas. If you go back to 1983, which is near the beginning of the breeding bird survey, you can see that half the country was forested. Only 20 years later, a lot of that forest is gone. So it's just, uh, it, there's no way that if you cut down two thirds of the forest that you're gonna be able to support as many wood thrushes as in the past. So here we have a really strong link between uh, wood thrush breeding declines and forest loss on the wintering grounds. We can also ask what are the most important stopover areas? Uh, because as I said, birds have to get back and forth and, and as bad as things are in the wintering grounds, um, there are a lot of obstacles during migration as well. So what we found with the wood thrush is, um, is a very clear loop migration for these Eastern populations. You can see in the fall, each line here is a different wood thrush that we tracked from these three uh, breeding populations. And you can see them in the fall, most of them go down the Eastern seaboard, which of course is heavily populated with people in cities. And they go down through Florida uh, and then make their way across to the Yucatan and then get down here into Nicaragua. In the spring, they come back a different way. So in the spring, they'll come up to the Yucatan. Most of them will cross the Gulf of Mexico, but you can see there's a lot of variation in their routes. And a few, like the one I showed you earlier, will chicken out uh, and go around the Gulf. But you know, the typical pattern is to make this kind of bullseye here, heading right towards the Mississippi River Delta. So we try to put this in numbers, we can say, well, 50%, half of all wood thrushes in Eastern North America will pass through Florida in the fall. So if we're trying to identify where do we need to protect forest habitat to save wood thrush, for sure, uh, this funnel, so to speak, of coming down through Florida and the Florida Panhandle, those areas are really, really important for wood thrushes. In the spring, we estimate 70% of all wood thrushes that breed in Eastern North America pass through this really narrow bottleneck uh, near New Orleans in the Mississippi River Delta. 
So geolocator tracking is amazing as, as it has been and continues to be. The big drawback, there's two. One is that only the birds that survive can give you any data. If they don't come back, you never get the tag, you never get the data. The other one is that because they're based on sunrise and sunset, the locations are not exact at all. You could be off a couple hundred kilometers. You get a rainy, cloudy morning like we had here, uh, where I am, and the sun will appear to come up later than it actually did. And so you can't pinpoint the exact spot um, where the birds uh, landed. But as I said, we have new technology that came up after geolocators, uh, which are these GPS archival tags. And one of my former students, uh, Callie Stanley, who helped with a wood thrush study that I just showed you, she went on to do a PhD at the University of Maryland and was using these uh, GPS tags to track wood thrushes. And here you have to program the tag to turn on for a short period of time in order to get a signal from the satellite and then it turns off again to save battery. So you can't get the full migration route like you can with geolocators. You can get snapshots along the way. Um, and those snapshots are exact locations. So here it shows in the round circles here, the circles, solid circles are the fall locations. So again, most of them are coming down through Florida. And in the squares, you can see these are the spring locations. Most of them are coming up through the Mississippi River Valley. What they did is to go and look at, you know, five kilometers around these points, what kind of habitat are wood thrushes using? So in this panel here, you can see the three different types of habitat dominated by agriculture, forest fragments, so like a split between agriculture and small forest patches, wooded savanna, which are sort of trees mixed in with grassland, and then forest, which is wood thrushes or forest birds, hence their name. And you can see that uh, for birds in the fall, most of them are using forest sites for stopovers, but a lot of them are forced into these alternative habitats, which are not, would, would not be what they're normally using. The same in the spring in red, less than half of them were able to find stopover sites that consisted of large tracts of forest. Instead, again, they're forced into these suboptimal habitats. How do we know they're suboptimal? If you look at uh, where they go on the wintering grounds, almost all birds uh, that they tracked, their wintering sites were pinpointed in nice forest habitat because there's still some left um, in Eastern Honduras and Northern Nicaragua, maybe not 20 years from now, but, but there's still a lot left now. So these, uh, this is just an example of how these GPS tags can take the geolocator tracking just that next step further to identify specific hop stopover sites and allow us to estimate the habitat quality of those stopovers. Again, these GPS tags are archival as well. Uh, archival meaning that the data are stored on the tag. And so Cali, for all these birds, <clears throat> uh, they came back to the breeding site where she was able to catch them and take the tag off and download the location data. It remains to be seen as, as one of my um, last um, parts of my talk will, will um, kind of address is what happens to birds who don't find these forest patches in terms of their survival. We don't have the tools yet to be able to know what happens to a bird when it doesn't come back. We don't know why birds uh, don't return. We don't know what causes mortality. Um, we're still uh, trying to figure out how to link stopover habitat quality with the fate of the bird afterwards. So we're gonna move on to a, a second example. This is kind of, you can see my interest in, in the tropics and the wintering grounds. Um, uh, I'd also, I, I actually did my PhD years and years ago on purple martins, but at that time I was interested in the behavior and, and how young birds go about claiming a nest cavity in one of these condominiums. There's a lot of fighting and squabbling and the young birds have a tough time um, working their way into the colony and, and getting grabbing a nest site. Um, and that was my interest at the time. Um, as, as time goes on, of course, where you see birds are declining and, um, and you wanna try to um, investigate what might be the causes of the decline. And here again, if you look at the, the purple martins, uh, what we knew 
15 years ago was at the breeding range kind of shown in, I guess it's kind of a gold color on my screen. The breeding range for the Eastern subspecies is here. And we knew that the wintering range of purple martins covers this huge area here. And otherwise uh, there were a few banned returns from Southern Brazil, you know, when people find uh, birds that are banded but are dead um, at roost sites. Um, so we really didn't know much at all about where exactly they went on the wintering grounds, and we certainly um, couldn't map their migration. All we knew is that, you know, some, somewhere in, you know, over most of South America, basically. The breeding bird survey, this map is kind of messy here. What it's meant to show is the percent change per year purple martin population. So if they're going down, it shows in red. If they're going up, it shows in dark blue. And well, I can see the pattern, but, but, um, but it might be kind of hard to discern. A lot of these Northern populations here are in red, meaning they're declining. Whereas the ones in the South tend to be in blue, uh, meaning that they're actually increasing. And so this inset map here makes it a little bit more clear. Uh, the, the black dots show declining populations and the open circles are increasing. And you can see the pattern a bit more easily here. So the question is why are Northern purple martins declining and Southern ones increasing? Like, well, and my thought originally was maybe they go to different areas in South America. You know, the wood thrushes have parallel migration, East versus West. Maybe in purple martins, there was like a leapfrog migration where the Northern populations were going to a different region and maybe experiencing different threats like like pesticide, for instance, or habitat loss. So I wanted to track purple martins and, and from across their breeding range and find out where they go on the wintering grounds and if there's a split. So we um, did the same sort of thing as wood thrushes. We used slightly smaller tags, tiny little stubby antenna. Uh, this is the purple martin with a backpack on. And this is just an example of a typical migration map. And this is a female that we tracked. It's one of the first we ever tracked uh, back in 2008. Uh, the bird stayed at its, um, at its um, pre-migration route and uh, roost until the 29th of August. And um, it's hard to look at these maps and not, not be absolutely blown away. So the bird is here in northern, like right on the shore of Lake Erie. Literally, that's where the roost is in a marsh on the shore of Lake Erie. And, and it leaves. And then by the 1st of September, it's already in southern Florida. It's like, what? That seems impossible. But that's what they did. Uh, that's what she did. Just a couple days, three flights to get all the way from Lake Erie down to southern tip of Florida. We had no idea that purple martins could fly so fast. Uh, it's really amazing. Uh, we estimate about 900 kilometers per day. As far as we know, they fly primarily or almost only in the daytime. So they're not doing, going 24 seven. They have to land and stop every night uh, to rest. They're daytime flyers, of course. So they race all the way down to Florida. And then what happens? Well. Suddenly they put on the brakes. A few days in Cuba, almost a week in the Yucatan, kind of mosey on down through Central America, and then finally doesn't get to this wintering site in Northern Brazil until the 26th of September. So although the whole migration is about a month long, it's just really mystifying where they, why they just like, it's like a slingshot. They just burst out of the breeding grounds and rush out down to Central America. It might have something to do with food supply, cooler temperatures maybe, longer days of course in the tropics at that time of year. Um, so, and then um, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but, um, but this bird stayed at this one site in Brazil for most of the winter. And then suddenly, and again, we don't really understand why they do this, it shifted roost sites and went up to the Northeast a little bit for the rest of the winter. In spring, it raced back up to the Yucatan, almost retracing its steps, and raced back up to Pennsylvania. In this case, migration was really, really rapid the whole way. It was in Brazil on the 15th of April, and it was in Pennsylvania by the 29th of April. So it's 14 days to cover 7,000 kilometers. Again, until we did this tracking, we had no idea that these small birds uh, were so such incredible athletes, just flying machines being able to do this. Of course, they're aerial insectivores, so we know they're good flyers, but still. 
We also found a kind of like for the wood thrushes, these sort of migration bottlenecks, so to speak. Um, these are tracks from our Pennsylvania population. <clears throat> and you can see that most of them uh, pass through the Yucatan Peninsula in spring and fall. Uh, and, and also through the Panama Canal, re Panama region, which is a land bridge, of course, and very, very narrow. So again, if we're trying to identify really, really important places for protecting habitat for purple martins, it would be in these areas where, where almost the entire population is funneling through a narrow area. Well, we were pretty surprised that our domestic purple martins who live in birdhouses in our backyards and you know people who are good martin landlords will pamper them and you know check the nests and clean out the nest cavities and they really enjoy their their backyard friends these birds would not be considered the wildest of birds uh, i think <laughs> on the breeding grounds because they're so domesticated um, and and live in birdhouses uh, the entire population in eastern north america is birdhouse dependent but in the winter time they're wild all of our birds, either, these are the places that we tracked birds from, we even Alberta, Texas, uh, this site was in Disney in Florida, in Orlando, uh, we have, this is my Pennsylvania site, so we tracked purple martins from most of the range in eastern North America, all of those birds completely mix up on the wintering grounds, so there's no separation at all, uh, and their core wintering region is the heart of the Amazon rainforest. You can see it better here. I'll trace with my mouse. This is the Amazon River going through here. This is Rio Negro that comes down through here. This is Manaus right in the middle here, the town of Manaus. And this area is one of the most heavily forested on the planet, especially in the Western region that's not deforested yet. And that's where our purple martins go. Uh, so we, I would not have guessed them to be a tropical forest dependent bird, uh, but they are. That's where they spend their winters. And just as a little bit of an aside, I don't want to get into it too much now, but we also had a collaborator on Vancouver Island that was studying the purple martins that, that uh, are different subspecies, the western subspecies, and they're a bit different. They don't like uh, colonial living. They're more solitary. And at least in the wild, um, they, they nest in tree cavities. Uh, solitarily. So they don't like birdhouses and they don't, maybe they don't like each other very much either because they don't like the, the condo living. Uh, and interestingly, the subspecies, which is, is divided by the Rocky Mountains, right, that go through here, uh, they have a completely separate wintering area um, over here in eastern Brazil. There's no overlap at all between the eastern and western subspecies in terms of the, where they winter. And this gets back to my point that young songbirds are genetically programmed to know where their destination is when they begin migration. Uh, we don't know how it works in the body, in the brain, uh, but when these birds leave uh, Vancouver Island, they know to go here instead of the Amazon rainforest, which I, I find astounding. Someday somebody will figure out how that works. You may be familiar with the, the purple martin roosts. Um, purple martins um, are kind of like, say, starlings or blackbirds that they gather in massive numbers at night for safety. Um, and these roosts can easily contain over 100,000 birds. They start to do this uh, at the end of the breeding season and gather in traditional pre-migration routes. And on their fall migration, they will stop at traditional roosts along the way. And they do, of course, the same um, when they get to their destination in Brazil. Uh, our roost site up near um, Erie, Pennsylvania is in Presque Isle State Park. And they've occupied that same marsh uh, for at least 25 or 30 years because I've been here that long uh, near my study site here. So what role do these roost sites play in habitat choice and, um, and loss of habitat? We're still trying to figure that out. This uh, is, shows the maps um, of the roost sites, because this is where the birds spend the night. So that's where the locations are. We, we're looking at where did they sleep at night um, by looking at sunset and sunrise times. And this sort of shows a heat map. Every dot is a different bird. And you can see that the main concentration of birds when they first arrive in Brazil is right here. This is Manaus, this is Rio Negro. Oops, sorry. This is Rio Negro. Uh, and so they're in the Western Amazon. Most of the birds are here in the Western Amazon. But like the one I, the map that I showed you, about half of purple martins will suddenly 
leave their first roost site and take off and fly hundreds of kilometers and relocate to a new place. Now, we don't really understand what prompts an individual to make this decision. We don't understand why only half of the birds do it. There does seem to be a pattern in that they tend to move east. So you can see this is the first roost site here in the Amazon, Western Amazon, second roost sites tend to be over the east, even as far as the mouth of the Amazon River here. So, you know, to find out why they're doing this, we need to go, go to Brazil and try to study the birds while they're there, which is uh, logistically challenging. This is due to wild, wild places, and um, it's really hard to study the behavior of an aerial insectivore because when they lead the roost, they cover a huge home range uh, as they're feeding during the daytime over the treetops. So logistically, it would be really difficult um, to find out what's going on in an individual's head. And why are they leaving now? There doesn't seem to be any difference in rainfall or temperature. And um, so we're not, we're not quite sure what this means, except that when it comes to conservation, um, we need to be protecting roost sites, not just here in the Western Amazon, but over here in the East, where there is a lot of deforestation. The color codes here, the gray are areas that are, uh, that are deforested. And so these birds are moving from the Western Amazon, which is heavily forested, to the Eastern, which is um, much less so. And uh, so, so this, uh, this is another example where a former student, Kevin Fraser, uh, who worked with me, he's now a professor at University of Manitoba, he decided to track purple martins with these GPS tags because um, they're so dependent on the Brazilian rainforest, we need to know where those roost sites are. That's their critical habitat, is where the roost sites are located. And so here are examples where he was able to pinpoint exactly where the roost sites are. And um, they're not, they're, it shouldn't be that surprising, but they're roosting in pretty safe places. So this example C is, shows on the map here where he tagged birds from different parts of the breeding range. This is Ontario, this is Pennsylvania, here's Alberta, that's Oklahoma, that looks like Minnesota, and Florida, the Disney birds. Uh, and when he tracked these birds, an individual from each of these populations ended up in exactly, exactly the same roost site on an island in a river in the Amazon rainforest. So this is what I talk about, these birds mixing up from across the whole breeding range, individuals from populations as far away as Alberta and Ontario are actually literally sitting side by side on the same island at night in a roost in, Amazon, in, in Brazil. Here are other examples where we have um, roost sites that are on the tip of a little island here. Another one, an island in a river, island in the river. So you get, you get the, the, the message that, that this vast Amazon rainforest, the whole thing isn't potential roost sites. It's these special islands in the river. And so Kevin has been pursuing that, trying to get down to Brazil on the ground uh, with students and trying to find out uh, what makes these roost sites special and what would happen if we lose them. A couple more examples of, of research um, that I've been working on using these different tracking technologies. Um, the first were, were sort of looking at what happens, you know, what role would winter and ground habitat loss play in these population declines? Um, and I said, at least in purple martins, well, they all, they all end up roost, roosting in the same areas in the Amazon. So we really can't explain <laughs> why northern populations are declining more than southern ones. We never got the answer to that, and, and no one else has either. So it remains a mystery. But there are other studies um, that we've been doing that are looking at shorter term um, experiments. And this is one done by Margaret Eng, again, a former student of mine. She did her master's degree with me at Long Point studying hooded warblers and the effects of forest fragments and logging on hooded warbler nesting success and fledgling survival. And so for that study, she had been using radio tracking to radio track fledgling hooded warblers to find out uh, if they survive well in a large forest patch like Bacchus Woods versus um, small fragments being logged. So she had a lot of experience uh, with radio tracking 
And she ended up doing a postdoc with myself and Christy Morrissey, uh, looking at the effects of pesticides on songbird migration. Um, and here, the, the Christy Morrissey is an ecotoxicologist. And so they developed a protocol. They first did a lab study and then followed up with this field study, which I'm going to talk to you about today, the field study. And so basically, they got set up at Long Point Bird Observatory in the spring, and they caught wild migrating white crowned sparrows. And so this would be the protocol here, day one and day two. In the morning, you catch your birds. And the ones that are in good condition, like they have a reasonable body weight and reasonable body fat, um, they get brought in to the experiment and you measure them. Um, then you test their migration orientation. We're gonna skip that part for now. And then the next day you dose them with a pesticide, which sounds nasty, but the only way you can test if a pesticide is having a negative effect on a bird is to experimentally give them some pesticide. In this case, uh, they're using a type of pesticide called the neonicotinoids, which are the ones that are so bad for bees. They're systemic in the plant and um, almost all corn, almost all, all canola used to be grown with um, these neonicotinoid pesticides. And so although they have a huge negative effect on birds, uh, on bees, I mean, um, nobody knew whether they affected songbirds and songbird migration. So day one, you catch the bird and you measure it. Day two, you give them their dose. So we had three groups, control, so no dose or blank, uh, low dose and high dose. And so the key to this kind of study is to set the proper dose. We want to try to simulate what a bird might experience at a stopover site in the wild. And so the high dose treatment we say high, it's relatively high. It's equivalent of a bird eating three canola seeds a day that are treated uh, with neonicotinoids. So that they're usually it's put on as a seed coating. And so the, the threat to birds that use agricultural habitat is actually eating coated seeds in the spring and ingesting them and thus getting exposed to the pesticide. So we think that this high dose, we don't just think, we have, can make a strong case that, that it's quite reasonable to think that a white crowned sparrow who found itself in an agricultural habitat in spring might eat as many as three canola seeds a day. Uh, we test for changes in body mass. Uh, then we put a, a radio tag on the bird. This is using the MODIS tracking system that I'll explain in a second. Um, and then we test for changes, as I said, changes in body mass. Then you release the bird and the two questions are, how does the stopover duration vary between birds that were treated and not treated? And then once they start migrating, are the birds that got treated with pesticide, do they know what direction to go? Are they going the right direction or not? So there's three different ways the pesticide can impact migration. Loss of body mass, which we expect would delay migration, uh, and then migration orientation once, once they finally get going. So this first graph shows, we don't need to look at all the panels, it's a lot of graphs, but this is the important one here, B is the change in body fat. This is over the course of just one day, keep in mind, um, that bird, control birds did not lose body fat over the one day, even though they've been in captivity for a day, um, but the high treatment birds lost about 20% of their body fat. So like an immediate rapid reduction in body fat. And we know what fuels migration body fat, that, that's the fuel that birds use to power the energy of their flights is they literally burn the fat to make energy to fly two, three, four, five, six, seven hours in a night. So this loss in body fat we expect would have immediate consequences on migration behavior because a bird in poor condition should not take off on migration. They would, they would just wait and try to rebuild their energy levels. Why did they lose weight? Well, they also did uh, measure how much food birds were eating. And you can see over here, this is food consumption uh, over time. And you can see that the control and low treatment birds were quite happy chowing down on, on their seeds when they're in captivity. But the high dose birds literally were sick and didn't wanna eat. So the reason, the behaviorally, the reason why they're losing fat is because they're not hungry, they feel sick. So these um, neonicotinoids make an immediate impact on the bird's physiology and they lose weight because they just don't feel like eating.
In terms of delaying departure, this is exactly what we expected to see. Uh, this graph shows the likelihood that a bird is gonna leave on a given day um, over stopover duration, how many days they've been on the ground. And so, of course, the more time a bird has been on the ground, the more likely it is to leave on a given day. Stopovers like five, six, seven days, maybe less on average. So you expect the probability of departure to always increase with stopover duration because they're not going to stay there forever. Um, but the important difference here, you can see dramatically, the control and low dose birds did not differ from each other. And for both of them, uh, they had a much higher probability of departure than did the high dose birds. So another way of putting this is that the high dose birds were greatly delayed in resuming migration. And we presume this was because of their low body fat. And then here comes the tracking part. Um, again, you wouldn't have been able to do this um, before they invented this system of automatically radio tracking birds. Um, it's really remarkable. Not only can the, the towers that are located at long point, they can tell you when your bird leaves. So we know stopover duration. We know what night the bird left on. But you also, because they fly by other towers, um, you can tell what direction they went. So the X's here show all the different modus towers uh, that were in place at the time of the study. You can see they're along the north shore of Lake Erie, north shore of Lake Ontario. And the control birds sort of went in this northeasterly direction. The low dose birds went in the northeasterly direction. And then the high dose birds did too. So this is one of the a little happy face here. This is one of the few sort of good news stories from our pesticide studies with white crowned sparrows um, is that in the wild, when they're exposed to pesticides, instead of flying the wrong direction, um, which presumably is enormously hazardous, they stay on the ground. They wait until they're recovered from the poison, basically, and then they continue on their way. But you can imagine, because this is such a, such a, well, it's only three canola seeds equivalent. As white crowned sparrows migrate from the southern US all the way up through the US and southern Canada, where there's a lot of agriculture, all these different stopover sites, they have the potential of encountering neonicotinoid coated seeds. And so if a bird is only encounters that once on their whole migration trip, okay, maybe that's all right. They're delayed by four or five days in, in getting to their Arctic breeding site. But, but, but imagine that if a bird encounters these two or three times on their northward migration, that's going to add up to maybe a week or two weeks delay. And the breeding season in the Arctic is very short. They have a short summer there. Uh, and again, eventually we want to find out how late arrival up there in the Arctic where they breed, the subarctic, is going to um, affect their nesting success, their survival. That's the next step is to try to connect this with what happens to the individual bird. Um, but this uh, automated telemetry system is really fabulous in allowing you for the first time ever to do a dosing study in the wild on a migrating bird. It's never been done before on a migrating songbird. So this is kind of alarming that these really common pesticides that are used all over the world, one of the most common pesticides in the world, there are new regulations, yes, in, in Europe and in Ontario and elsewhere, trying to limit the use of neonicotinoids, but um, still it's really alarming that they seem to have such an immediate and drastic effect on our little songbirds. And the last study uh, I'm going to talk about, are we doing for time? Pretty good. Um, this will go quick. Um, Red-eyed vireos, um, we also did a geolocator study on them, and they also winter in, um, not, not, not really where the purple martins are, a little bit farther north in the northernmost Amazon, southern Venezuela. So all of the, our Pennsylvania population, instead of spreading out all over South America, this is their core wintering area right in here, relatively small area. And the one thing that we noticed, um, with our geolocator tracking study, which was really curious to me, was that um, the birds that arrive in South America early, so like take these ones, they arrive in mid-October. So these birds are arriving in October. These are the same birds that leave early in the spring, in March. Whereas the birds that arrive late in South America are the same ones that leave late 
in the spring. In the meantime, five months has elapsed. So if they're late migrating because they have low body fat or they have, didn't get enough food or had poor stopover habitat, they should be able to recover from all of that within weeks or a couple of months at most. The fact that we have early birds and late birds, even five months apart, suggests that it's an intrinsic genetic trait. Some individuals are early birds, some individuals are late birds. So that's fascinating in itself. Um, our, the next thing that I wanted to do, and this is a study I'm doing right now um, here in Pennsylvania, uh, is to understand like what difference does it make if you're an early bird or late bird in terms of your survival? And even what time you pass through certain regions, what habitats you're using, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I did, I did, use this MODIS network. And you can see here, these show the towers, uh, not just in Ontario, but the, the system is being really expanded in Pennsylvania. Every yellow dot is one of these receiver towers and the little ellipses estimate the receiver range. Um, and here's one of the nano tags and here, just the, so relative to a pencil. Uh, so they're, they're, they're really tiny tags. Um, and we tagged 38 birds um, a year ago little over a year ago at my study site here. So we have a tower at the study site. So um, kind of like the white crowned sparrow study, we know when our birds are leaving at the end of the breeding season. So we put them on breeding males uh, and then wait to time their exact time of departure from the breeding site. So here shows a male with his little tag on the back. And this shows uh, just to get a feel for what the towers are showing. So here's, for instance, bird 190. And you can see it's detected almost every day by the tower because it's right near here. Uh, and so these birds here, like I downloaded the tower on the 31st of August. So that's these, all these birds are still here on the 31st of August. But look at this one. Da -da 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 -da. Oh, it left on the 28th of August. This one left on the 7th of August. This one left on the 6th of August. So you can see we have early birds and late birds in terms of departures. Our latest departure, I think was October 7th when I finally uh, had the last one leave. So like almost two month variation in onset of fall migration, which again, we don't understand what's going on in the bird's genes or in the bird's head to, to know why on a given night, it suddenly decides to begin migration. So you can see this huge range in departure dates and, and we know that these are migration departures because we know the exact time of the last detection. And when you put, uh, put this on like a, um, like a clock sort of map, sunset would be right here. On average, birds are leaving an hour and a half, an hour and a half after sunset, which is exactly what we'd expect if these are migration movements. Uh, we just had a couple that kind of left during the daytime, but almost all of them are leaving at night as you would expect for a nocturnal migrant. So our big question here, and this is this study, I can't tell you the answer because we're still working on it. Our, our birds, well, it's not, most of them have left. So we tagged a bunch of birds this spring and uh, by now most of them will, will have left because it's October 3rd, I think. Um, and what I wanna do is, is use these um, modus tags to try to understand how fall departure time affects migration survival. Because if you remember the geolocators and the GPS tags you can only get information on birds that survive the entire journey. So you never know who the losers are. You never know what, where they were on their last detection. So this just gives you an example from a bird from last year where MODIS has the potential to tell us uh, more information, even for birds that didn't come, come back. So bird 198 here left on the 3rd of September, which is kind of average. Um, and never came back, didn't see him this spring at all, didn't come back, so, but we had a detection in Columbia on the 27th of February, so we know that he survived his fall migration. So we want to piece this together year after year by tagging a, a lot of males and using these detections on the wintering grounds, but also during fall migration and spring migration to try to understand how timing of fall migration uh, affects individual survival. We're also curious if, if birds can be flexible from year to year in response to changes in climate. 
So I've mentioned a few times in my talk, all the things that, <clears throat> that we don't know about songbird migration, despite all the hundreds of papers that have come out the last decade. It's just an amazing explosion of new knowledge, but there's still some tricky questions that we don't know the answer to. One of them is climate change. Um, for most birds, we don't know how flexible an individual bird is. So can it leave early in one year and late in another? Can it respond to climate change, to red-eyed vireos? Can they come back earlier in warm springs than late springs? There's only a handful of studies that have um, I looked at those questions. What happens if an individual is not flexible, that they have lower survival? And in terms of stopover areas, we talked uh, about some of the specific stopover sites of wood thrushes. We talked about migration bottlenecks. As climate changes and precipitation rain patterns change and temperatures change and habitats change, we don't really know how the birds' innate migration routes uh, are going to shift in response to shifts in habitat and climate. Um, we just don't know. So I'm sure that this work will continue for decades more to come and hopefully we'll get a new magic technology uh, coming out in the next few years to allow us to answer some of these questions. I'm gonna stop screen sharing now um, and see if there are questions. Uh, somebody Hello, asked. I have a question. Yeah. Just hang on a second. Hello, I have a. Can uh, you hear me? I'm on a phone. I'm I'm on a phone, not on a computer. Okay, go ahead on the phone. <laughs> yeah. Well, the one question I have is, I was kind of interested about the gathering of the hundred thousand uh, purple. Was it the purple martin? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that, and I thought, I wondered, do they ever gather, sort of like us, we're not gathering, and so we're not having that energy in, in exchange with each other. I just wondered, do they gather to confer? Do they gather to gather their forces to support each other? How do they communicate with each other? I always wondered, when I watch the bird on the wire, and they, ro they line up in the rows, and I think, are they talking? Are they... What are they saying? Are they planning? Did they t say the rain is coming, get out of the way? Like, do you know anything about that convert when they gather? Yeah, when, when purple martins gather in these massive numbers, it's for safety um, because predators are attracted to these roosts, hawks. But if, if oh, you see okay. these massive groups of starlings or even red-winged blackbirds or purple martins, they're just, I know you can't see me, but I'm waving my hands around. There's just so many birds moving, it's just chaos. And um, even if a hawk picks off one bird, if you're in a group of 100,000, it's probably not going to be you. So this sort of gathering in large numbers is oh, okay. anti-predator behavior. And yes, it's noisy. There's a lot of chitter chatter, a lot of jostling uh -huh. for position. There are probably sites in the trees within the roost that are safer than others. Like there are also like climbing snakes and mammalian predators that might come up from the oh. bottom. So the, oh, okay. the birds are kind of elbowing each other and, and just, you know, when they first come into the roost, there's a lot of pushing and shoving and squawking that goes on. Uh, and then they finally settle down and, and you can hear a pin drop almost. Um, so really? I think there, you know, there is a little bit of competition there. As far as we know, they're not sharing information about say where the food was today uh, or, or things like that. I mean, birds do have some capacity of course to communicate um, yeah, but as far as we know, most, yeah, most of the squawking is probably a little bit aggressive and stay out of my way kind of message. Okay, great. Wow. Okay, I have more questions. I'll wait for somebody else. All right. Thank you. Uh, there is one thank on the you. chat room I can answer. Um, does the early bird and late bird piece um, sort of maybe that's traced to whether they're males or females? That's a good question because um, certainly in spring. We know that males tend to come back, well, not tend to, males often come back earlier than females because they set up the territories and, um, and have to claim a territory uh, and sing and, and patrol their territory boundaries. And, and they do that before the females even show up usually. Uh, and, and so it is possible that males and females have different migration timing because, because, of, because of their different roles in, in breeding. In our case, in red-eyed vireos, we did tag only males. Um, and so we know that all this variation and differences that we saw and were surprised at were among just the males. And um, 
it's really hard to catch female red-eyed vireos. So that's why we, I'd love to be able to do it. But a male red-eyed vireo, if you play back his song, like see me up here, but I pretty, you go to a breeding territory and play back that song under a mist net. They come down out of the canopy and you catch them within a couple of minutes. They're super, super aggressive. Um, females are nesting up in the canopy and it would be extremely hard to catch more than just a handful every summer. Any other questions? You can use the chat room, raise your hand, you and go back to the phone. Uh, Bridget, I've um, oft, often marveled at the um, uh, those am amazing um, congregations of red-winged blackbirds. We just see them. Um, we have a property in Northumberland County, and it feels like all the red-winged blackbirds in Northumberland County gather in this. this probably month. do. <laughs> Yeah, I think so. Um, but I think what amazes me is the uh, formation flying. Like they just, the, the flying is completely coordinated. And I've often wondered what, um, uh, like how, it, are they all responding to the same like air currents or are they are they feeding off each other? Like, I mean, it's precision flying and they're all moving in the same, you know, curving in the same direction and uh, doing backflips together, whatever they're doing, you know, it's craziness. And, and that's, it's an amazing phenomenon. I think the starlings are the best at it, the so-called murmurations of the starling, where you, they just swirling clouds of birds. Yeah. And, um, and we don't, you know, we don't really have the technology to understand how they coordinate their movements within a flock like that. Mm -hmm. um, there must I mean birds have extremely good sensors uh, in their feathers, so they know where each other are and can detect the air pressure, you know, and they're extremely good okay. flyers and such. But in terms of like the nitty gritty, how exactly does an individual bird maneuver in a flock and how do you get a flock? Coordinating somehow it's not really because one is talking to one 100 meters away. They're really mm -hmm. just sensing each other's movements like literally beside each other and somehow or another that creates like an overall group behavior okay so it's a really good question and it's just i mean i can watch those you know endlessly oh, <laughs> everyone's different and it's like totally. it's like this spectacle of nature it's like well, how do they do that it's sort of like schools of fish you know they do the same sort of thing and yeah uh, i can go to the chat room there's a couple more question uh, any hope for more modus towers in South America, or is it a black hole? Um, there, they are putting up towers, expanding the system more and more. I think South America is going to be the tough one, uh, especially say in the Amazon rainforest. There's um, still a low, very low human population density there, and low services in terms of cell coverage and other things like that. Um, but certainly they, you know, what started to be sort of an Ontario and Atlantic Canada project has now spread all the way down the eastern seaboard. Um, they have modus towers all along the Gulf of Mexico. So maybe it's just a matter of time. But I think some areas, especially in Central and South America, um, it's a matter of having a, an organization with enough resources. It takes a couple thousand dollars to build a tower. So I mean, who's going to pay for that and maintain it and um, take care of it? Uh, we need sort of North American conservation groups, I think, to really adopt that as an important project. Uh, somebody has a question here about white crowned sparrows. Uh, are there maps of pesticide concentration in agricultural lands that can be obtained to compare to migration success? Yes, in the US. Uh, I know that you, we need, really need it. I'm not an ecotoxicologist, but I know in the US you can get um, pesticide maps of different types of pesticides and concentrations. Uh, and farmers are, report, are you know, required to report their usage. As far as I know in Canada, there's at least uh, for the public, there's no easy way to obtain um, that kind of information. Um, but yeah, but, but I, think, I think what we really want to know is where individual birds land. So it would be interesting to use that GPS tracking technology on a white crowned sparrow. If they can make the tags just a teeny bit smaller, then we would, could track white crowned sparrows um, and, and hopefully find out just exactly where they're landing and to what extent they're being exposed um, to particular fields that are treated or not treated uh, with pesticides. I have a, a pesticide question as well. Sure. Okay. Um, is it possible? How? Like, if one were to just test.
bird. Because pesticides are so ubiquitous in our world, I wonder, can birds be tested? How would you test a bird before? Like, to know how many, what's the load that a bird might carry in terms of pesticide in its body? Rather than let's say dosing it before, after, you know, before the trip, you know what I mean? They probably yeah. already there. It's um, so. How how do you, how does that how can that be tested? Do you have any idea about? Yeah, that? I do. Um, um, there's pesticides like these neonicotinoids. Um, they pass through your body. Say like if you're having, you know, a beer or a glass of wine with dinner, you can feel the effect right away. But when you wake up the next morning, it's all gone. It's not in your system anymore. Oh, really? Oh, okay. And so the body metabolizes these uh, pesticides. Oh, I didn't um, know that. Yeah. And, and so, you know, like you can think back to the unfortunate days of DDT. DDT yeah. is the chemical that is stored in the fat of your body. So you don't uh -huh. just pee it out, so to speak. It builds up in your fat. And so um, that had a devastating effect, as we all know, on, on the top predators, things like uh, peregrine falcons and oh. not people like cormorants that had a bad effect on cormorants um, in the Great Lakes. Um, so, so, but there are tests. There are, they have developed, Christy Morrissey, my co uh, collaborator, has worked with other ecotoxicologists and they've developed very, very sensitive blood tests. So... Huh. Um, so they, when they, with the, for these white crowned sparrows, for instance, they took blood samples and found that 80% of them had some level, as tiny as it might be, they had had prior exposure to these neonicotinoids. Because again, one of the arguments in these pesticide studies is, of course, if you poison them, they're going to feel sick. The question is, how realistic is this happening in, in the field, in, in nature? And so not only... The, did the dose correspond to only three canola seeds, but also the wild birds upon first capture, uh, something like 80% of them had some trace levels of neonicotinoids showing that somewhere along the way they had eaten this stuff, I don't know, in the last uh, week or something like that. So it, right, it makes right, the study right. much more realistic. Yeah. Yes, but the yes. trouble is, like, if it's, it's the same as having your beer and wine, if you have too much and do it every single day, it's probably not good yeah. for your health. But if you only do right, it once right. a week, then so that, that's the same sort of dosing problem with these neonicotinoids. If it's constant exposure, uh, yes. and of course they're probably they're exposed on their wintering grounds in the southern U.S. as well. So they're probably picking. Uh -huh. you know, we don't know what over the whole winter. For all we know, they're being exposed every single day. Right. Right. Thank you. Let's see, I'm going to scan through the chat room here and uh, let's see, concentration maps. The purple martin Brazil switch, is there any known seasonal change in wintering habitat? So this is where they shift roosts. Um, we did check for that because we know the roost sites and so we checked for uh, temperature and rainfall patterns and there's no, and, you know, as we would expect, there's no major switch at that time of year in Brazil. It's not like there's a sudden onset of the dry season. And so they're kind of forced out to go somewhere else. We couldn't find any effect of rainfall or temperature. Um, and in terms of habitat, you know, their original sites are in the heart of the Amazon rainforest where there's uh, like 98% forest cover. It's one of the last places on the planet like that. And strangely, when they move eastward, they're going to areas with less forest cover um, because of deforestation, you know, the past 20 or 30 years in, in, in Brazil. Um, and so we don't know if these shifts have sort of like what I call normal migration where the birds are kind of pre-programmed and that's just what they do. They go here and then after a period of time, they go east. I don't know if it's something that's kind of pre-programmed genetically or whether individual birds are literally responding to their environment. One idea we had, which we haven't tested, is that maybe the roosts get too crowded. So when the birds first arrive in Brazil, they all go to Manaus and they're on these tiny islands, right? And there's all this jostling and squabbling. It may be that those little islands just get filled up and they get so filled and over crammed with birds that they get fed up and just leave and go somewhere else. Um, and we don't know if that's true, but it was one idea that maybe this intense competition at these roost sites is kind of forcing some of them to go. And it doesn't really make sense because why would they fly all the way to the mouth of the Amazon if they just need a bit more space? It doesn't totally make sense, but anyway, it's an idea. <laughs> there's, a, there's a question in the chat, are insectivores affected by pesticides? 
Um, yes, but we think it's mostly indirectly because we said like the, the insects, um, that it, insects that encounter pesticides, say in the water, would, would temporarily have pesticides in their body, but insects too would metabolize the pesticide and, and eventually, you know, it would be shed. So it's possible, you know, if, it, if insects are constantly being exposed to pesticides and the birds eating those insects might get exposure through their diet. Um, but there have been studies that show that, you know, neonicotinoids do their job and kill insects in such massive numbers that there's not enough, not enough food for birds to eat. So the insectivores may actually be facing a food shortage if we're doing too good a job at, at killing off their food base. So there's some, there's some evidence for this, uh, especially in Europe where they showed um, that non-seed eating birds, like birds that do not eat seeds, um, their populations are declining more steeply in areas where there's more pesticide use. So it's not like proof proof, um, but there's a strong correlation there that in the regions in the Netherlands where they have heavy, heavy use of pesticides, the, ins the insectiv insectiv insectivorous birds uh, are doing badly in those regions and doing okay in regions uh, where there's less pesticide use. Um, so definitely need more, more studies to try to understand, you know, whether it's direct effect on the body or indirect effect, effect through um, less food for them. I'll make sure I didn't, didn't miss anybody. I just want to say, what about a question about bird song? I, I am just a personal question. I wonder what attracted you to birds. Perhaps it was through their song and what you know about their song and how that might relate to, to all the migrate. I don't know. I don't know even what the question is because I know so little about birds. But is there something <laughs> well, you're not talking to the right person. <laughs> um, Pardon? I said you're talking to the right person if you don't know much about Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. um, I, well, in, I, I started studying birds kind of by accident. Um, I wanted to be a field biologist when I was at Queen's University doing my undergraduate degree and I got hired by a professor who studied tree swallows. But oh. I, mean, I would have been just as happy working on bluegill sunfish, to be honest, or dragonflies, uh -huh. to be out doing nature. And what uh -huh. really got me hooked on research was part of my job was to go around and check all the nest boxes and count the eggs and such. And so oh. it was not long after I started, I opened up a box to look inside and there were two females in there just hammering away at each other, fighting like crazy. One of them had all the feathers oh. stripped off of her head because the other one oh was, my God. and I was just shocked that these tiny, beautiful little birds were so incredibly oh. vicious. Um, I didn't know that birds, you know, fought with each other and, and hurt each oh. other. And, and again, it's this, this, it's this um, winner takes all where um, we think of birds as being kind of cute and friendly and singing beautifully. But uh, for them, getting a territory is, is their future. That's their whole future Survival. species, yeah. so to speak. And their own genes is to get a territory and, and stop another male from, from kicking them out. And for these females, they're fighting over the nest boxes. They need a nest box oh. to breed in. And somebody tries to take that away, they're going to fight. Oh, anyways, yeah, it was yeah. actually, the, it sounds kind of weird to say, but it was that, that kind of violence which got me intrigued with bird behavior. Like, because I just, uh -huh. it was shocking to me that females were doing this. Yeah. Uh -huh. And what about the songs? How do their songs relate to their person, like who they are in a way? It's, it's so musical to our ears sometimes. But yeah, uh, it is. It is, and it's, is it's, it, it's, it's interesting that, you know, like the, the human perception is that songs are beautiful and musical, but not all of them are. I mean, I, I don't think house mm -hmm. friends sound all that great. Ch -ch 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 -ch. Um, so mm -hmm. like humans, humans are drawn to sounds that sound like music, but birds communicate with non-musical sounds very well. And so it is a very strong human bias to kind of put our own world interpretation right. onto the bird. Right. right. Uh, uh -huh. And if a bird sounds beautiful, they must be saying something nice to each other. Not necessarily. <laughs> no. They might be yelling, go away and get out of my territory and I hate you. But in our own minds, you know, we interpret the beautiful sounds as being Maybe they're even talking to us. We we're that we're that egotistical uh -huh. to think that they're singing for us instead of yelling at each other. So, anyways, I, I'm gonna well, like a mocking, it. yeah, 
Yeah, I'm going to take a few questions. Uh, I'm going to take a few questions from the chat room because a few people have typed some oh, in. Sure, sorry. Okay, no, that's okay. We'll see. Hang, stay on the phone. I just I don't want to miss anybody here. I uh, got that one. There's a question from Marcel about Alberta and Saskatchewan. Oh, I, okay, I found that one. Any thoughts as to why Alberta, Saskatchewan, Purple Martin populations seem to be increasing, whereas those in Eastern Canada are declining? Uh, I have no idea. But we don't even know why northern populations like in Pennsylvania are declining and Florida is increasing. Um, it, it might be something on the breeding grounds. I mean, these birds are so pampered. They have bird houses, so there's not a shortage of nest sites, right? Um, whether it's a shortage of food because of agriculture, we don't know. Um, is, you know, for all, we don't know very little, we don't know very much at all about diseases and parasites in birds. I mean, that's, that's really tricky to study. Um, winter differences maybe um, in terms of timing of migration. The ones in Alberta, of course, um, you know, leave on my, you know, they have a shorter season and so they'll leave earlier, but they have longer to fly. <laughs> their, their trip is much, much, much longer than a bird from Florida. So the, the birds at Disney and Orlando, I mean, they, they get back in January, February, which is kind of nice to think that the Purple Martins are, are they're back in the U.S. No, that's the, the Florida population. They don't get back to Pennsylvania till April. And so each population has its own timing clock. You know, the Alberta birds go at this time and Pennsylvania at this time and Florida at that time. And again, that's all innate. Um, you know, the baby birds just know when to go. It's then that the, the sort of clock gene is something that they understand reasonably well in birds that how birds tell time and keep track of what so, time of year to do things. Yeah. Is the Delta variant, um, you know, that went through various variants, <laughs> is that uh, where you are in, in England? Uh, I'm physically right now in northwestern Pennsylvania at my study site. Um, we've been doing this red-eyed vireo study here. Um, yeah. Uh, are insectivores affected by pesticides. I think we did that one. Does South America still allow use of pesticides? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think, you know, Europe is probably way farther ahead in pesticide regulations than North America. And by the same token, uh, in Central and South America, they're very, what regulations exist are extremely hard to enforce anyways. Um, and so studies like, you know, that I wrote about in Silence of the Songbirds, where you look at pesticide residues on the food that comes into our stores that we all buy in the wintertime, especially because we, you know, hopefully some of us are able to have backyard gardens in the summer, but in the winter time, we're reliant on the grocery store. And yeah, the pesticide residues uh, prove, you know, that those pesticides are being used uh, in large quantities on the wintering grounds and, and they can't check everything that's imported. Um, so unfortunately, yeah, our, um, our birds are probably being exposed today to the same levels of toxic pesticides as they were 20 years ago, if, if not more so. That's just um, our food supply system um, just allows that, um, unfortunately. I think I remember reading last year that uh, Brazil was actually hugely increasing their use of pesticides that are banned in Europe and North America. Um, Probably because so they work. It increases gonna, production, and and yeah. you can um, you can produce a higher grade product because there's they look well. I mean, they, when you buy at least at the store in my in my neighborhood in Toronto, we I shop at the Fortinos, and the food looks like it's being smeared with pest grown with pesticides because you know the, they only put out on the shelf stuff that looks beautiful, and when you grow your own food, you know you know you know it doesn't always come out looking perfect, right? Um, even even if it's tasty, so yeah, to, to produce you know red peppers and broccoli and things like that that, that looks perfect to the consumer um, and isn't nibbled on by by insects and such and does require often pesticides. Um, back, uh, another question about Brazil: Is there any known seasonal change? Oh, I think we talked about that one. Would purple martin switching from first arrival to second be following a food source? I think I think that's that that's what we don't know because nobody you know this this remote geolocator tracking and GPS tracking and modus tracking um, is fabulous to answer a whole bunch of questions I've kind of gone through in my talk just a few examples 
Um, but there's some questions where you need to be there in person. So if we want to know what kind of food these birds are eating, we would somehow have to get, well, this would be the best way to do it. It sounds gross, but when, when, when birds come into the roost and, and sit on the branches, of course, a lot of feces will come raining down as they uh, settle in to go to sleep. One could collect that and find out what they've been eating, either through you know digging, digging through the body parts and identifying what type of insects, or nowadays they have, um, they, they can analyze the DNA in the poop and find out, you know, match up the DNA with the, the different types of insects. So in theory, one, one could go and do a food analysis and see if the birds are eating something different uh, between the Western and Eastern parts of Brazil. Um, so, you know, so a, a lot of these things are like, they're, they're difficult to study because birds fly and they're highly mobile. Uh, if you wanted to actually observe the birds actually eating as they're flying around, that'd be pretty much impossible, I would think. So there's a lot of really neat questions that we, we still are a bit stumped on getting the answers because it's, uh, we, we're not birds and we can't fly around and, and really observe them in their own element. Um, we're stuck on the ground and we, um, you know, the migration tracking has opened up huge insights into what these birds are experiencing on migration, um, but still a lot of questions. And I'm wondering if there are Aboriginal people living in the Amazon who would have observed some of these, like observed some they're probably, they're probably, you know, given the size of the roosts, they're ma absolutely massive. They're hard to miss. And these birds are there from, well, the, the um, birds from Florida arrive at the roosts, I think in April or May, uh, no, May, May or June. So the, the, so the first roosts start forming around May or June when the, the Southern birds show up. Um, and they're probably there right through till March or so. So that's a big hunk of the year and they're pretty hard to miss. So you, so you would think that the local indigenous people would have some traditional ecological knowledge and traditions around purple martins and what they mean to them and where they came from. And um, we, I don't know of anyone who's um, you know, done those kind of social studies to try to see, see what the knowledge is. That's a really good idea. Bridget, may I ask whether you might have another um, book in the works uh, with uh, conservation advice um, for, for small nature groups like the, the people gathered here today? Yeah, I think one, one um, well, I do have another book in the works. I kind of put it on hold during COVID because it requires traveling and that, that sort of is out of the question. Um, but I, I am working on a book um, on endangered species and trying to address the really tricky question of how much is it worth to save a species. Um, there's only so many, so much money in the pot for conservation. And there's so many species that are endangered now that um, it's, you know, I don't want to be uns unsensitive, but it's sort, it's sort of like when the hospital ICUs get full and they have to decide who gets saved and who doesn't in a way that the conservation ICU is kind of full and there's only so many resources. And, and unless we put more money in and, and you know, increase the amount of conservation funding tenfold or a hundredfold, these species will go extinct. And so, so really the book is about, of course, you know, we should build more hospitals for, for wildly, hospitals for wildlife. Um, but in the meantime, how do we make those decisions about should we, Mm -hmm. save this species or that species. And, and those decisions are being made right now in the US and Canada, New Zealand, Australia. They have a triage system for picking which species get saved and which ones get ignored. So it's a fascinating question, but in, in writing the book, I really wanted to travel internationally and, uh, and visit the conservation groups that are you know, trying to save species like the, the Jeffreys marmoset or the uh, uh, gold, no. Uh, I can't remember the name of it now, it's been so long. But anyways, uh, you know, like being able to travel to Colombia and, and, and meet the biologists and the local peoples who are trying to save critically endangered species. So it'll probably be another year or two, I'm guessing, before I can, can get back to that. Yeah. Con advice for conservation organizations. I think uh, my advice is maybe trivial, but it's every little bit helps. Um, you know, the, the problems, can seem so overwhelming. Um, you know, what can I do about it? 
Um, but I'm a big, big, huge fan of consumerism. We've been talking about pesticides. Well, every grocery store pretty much has an organic food section and you can buy organically grown rice and you can buy shade grown coffee and you can buy toilet paper that comes from recycled paper products. And gosh, if everybody did that, what a game changer. So just the, you know, for me, the public awareness um, and being able to um, really encourage everybody that you yourself are not going to change the world. But if we all are in this together, you know, all the naturalists out there, all the moms who want their kids growing up in a healthy world and environment that, you know, there's a huge percentage of the population that does want a healthy planet. And when you go to the store, that's when you can cast your vote, you know, every time you go shopping. That's terrific advice. Thank you. There's a question from Kathleen about what types of programs you would suggest to someone wanting to become a field biologist. Uh, do you mean like a probably, um, if you think like education wise, um, certainly, um, you know, that, that, that was my path as I decided, well, it, it's actually when I, when I first um, started my undergraduate degree at Queens, I had no idea what I wanted to do. So I was your typical undergraduate that was going to university because that's what you're, that's, isn't that what you do? I didn't really have an alternative. If you finish high school, it's like, well, I don't know, I guess I'll go to university. Uh, in the first two years, I was really uh, discouraged and disappointed and kind of lost because I didn't have any idea why I was there. And um, then I ended up taking a course in ecology and we went on a field trip and we went out on the lake and we were taking sediment samples and water samples and we were catching fish. And I, I decided that weekend, I wanted to be a field biologist. I didn't know there was such a thing, honestly. When I started university, I didn't know anything about wildlife biology and conservation or nobody even talked about conservation back then. But um, so yeah, certainly, um, an important step is to is to get the education you need. Um, often that does require getting like a zoology degree or or taking an ecology focus. Um, there are there are other routes. You don't you don't have necessarily have to go on and do graduate school and, and high powered research. I mean, their field biologists are needed for environmental consulting when people are doing habitat and uh, assessments when uh, a new development is coming in. They need field biologists who are going to go and assess the the plants and animals. And conservation areas need field biologists as well to manage their properties. Um, and of course, you know, people who study people like myself who study study animals and plants so we need field biologists as students and as field assistants and such so there there it's, it's like anything if you really fall in love with it and it's your passion then uh, you just go for it and hopefully it'll work out somebody's saying here it's unfortunate that we have to that humanity is even talking about um for non-human species um and I think, you know, with respect to triage, um, the, the comparison to a hospital is not, is, is very compelling from a politician's point of view, because if we triage in hospitals, why can't we triage in nature? Uh, and, and so the very use of the word triage, I think, is a little bit misleading. It, it gives politicians an easy way out. It's like, well, of course we have to triage, if, you know. But actually, you know, in conservation, we, we don't have, we rarely have sudden unexpected catastrophes like we have the last year and a half with COVID. Um, you know, that blindsided us, the whole world. But, you know, most of our endangered species, like we look at the wood thrush, it's been declining for 40 years. This is not an emergency room, you know, ICU kind of situation. This is chronic healthcare for the planet. And so, um, you know, for most of our species, uh, they're declining because of habitat loss and human overpopulation and overconsumption of resources. So the idea that we have to let them die because we can't do anything about it is absolutely wrong, right? It's, it's, not, it's not triage, it's economics. We can't be bothered to spend the money to save them. We can't be bothered to give up, you know, some of our profits in order to, you know, set aside the boreal forest of Canada and not log the whole thing. So it is, it, it, the whole 
like I could go on for this for hours, but yeah, the whole use of the word triage is very misleading because it's really more of an economic cost benefit analysis. How much is it going to cost us to save the Eastern loggerhead shrike in Ontario? And is it really worth it? And so when you say, is it worth it? I would say, yeah, of course. Uh, you ask an average taxpayer, they'd go, yeah, I don't care about the shrike. So yeah, so again, a lot of it is just awareness and, and how we place value on nature and not being so uh, human centric um, as we look forward to the future. And I think climate change in a way uh, is teaching us that lesson that we can't be so arrogant as to ignore nature because it's gonna come back and bite us, you know, where, um, and it is already, you know, the, the massive cost of climate change on our economies and on human health and on our children right now is just going to far, far, far a million times outweigh the cost of doing something about it. So anyways, you can see it's my favorite subject. <laughs> Do you hear me? I'm not, I unmuted myself. So I can I hear you. Yep. Well, Matt, I, I wanted to ask a question. Um, using sunrise and sunset uh, has its limits in terms of precision because of overcast days and so on. Uh, so can that not be correlated with the weather report for that day? And secondly, is it even worth doing that? It can be, except um, that, the, that the weather can vary even over a couple of hundred kilometers. So if you knew where the bird was, then you could get the weather report. But we actually don't know where the bird is. We can only kind of guess. And um, but you're right. I mean, there one could try to refine it a little bit by saying we think the bird is here. What was the weather on that day? Maybe we can do some adjustments. So it's, it is a good point that there might be a way to to clean it up a little bit and reduce some of the error by doing that. Um, there's there's also a time of year uh, with geolocators where um, we just went through it a couple of weeks ago. Um, the fall equinox is the time of year when there's 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of darkness everywhere on the planet. So you can't actually estimate latitude during the equinox period using these geolocators because there's everything's the same everywhere on the planet. And that happens again in the spring around March 21st. So um, that one's hard to get around, but at least with our birds, it's kind of interesting that they do so many east-west shifts that even if we don't know the latitude, the north-south exactly, if they make a big shift one direction or the other to the east or west, then at least we know that part. Uh, but there are those blackout periods about three weeks around the equinox where uh, we just don't know the latitude of the birds and uh, it's really hard to figure that out. Last question. Um... I've heard birds and other animals use magnetic field of the earth, possibly. Uh, definitely, yes. Yeah, birds uh, very definitely use the magnetic fields uh, of the earth to navigate. Uh, and they can even actually see the magnetic field with their eyes. So we think, you know, we think of birds, somebody asked a question earlier about bird song and how similar it is to human music. We like humans like to, to sort of acclaim a similarity with animals that perhaps that isn't, is kind of fantasy in a way. Um, but uh, birds are not closely related to mammals at all. They evolved from dinosaurs, right? Uh, and bird vision, um, even though their eyes fundamentally work kind of like ours, you know, as they do in all vertebrates, um, birds can see ultraviolet, for instance, and we can't. Uh, and they have mechanisms in their eyes that allow them to actually visualize the magnetic field and, and literally see it. It sort of can imagine that we think it's sort of like a glow on the horizon, like, a, you know, it's not an arrow, it's not a compass, but, but they can turn their head and they can actually sense the magnetic field through their visual system, which is really cool. And you can show that. I mean, you can cover up the eyes and show that they can't see, that they can't detect it anymore. No. Can you use um, geolocators instead of using sunrise and sunset, use magnetic fields? You could, yes, because the, um, the magnetic fields vary right across the, I'm not an expert on this, so if anybody else oh. is, chip in. Um, but yeah, the mag strength of the magnetic field uh, varies as you move around the planet. And the angle, 
Europe, but I don't know if you can see me, but the angle at which the magnetic field interacts with the planet varies across the planet from almost vertical to almost flat. That's called the inclination, I think is the right word. Right. Um, and so, yeah, there, the um, birds, there actually was a study done in Europe um, where they were testing whether birds can detect that inclination. Um, this to, is kind of complicated to get into, but basically they translocated birds uh, eastward by about a thousand kilometers and then tested them in captivity to see if they could tell that they'd been secretly moved and they could. So even though they were in like, the, uh, not literally, but like pretend they were moved in a black box on an airplane and they had no sensory system, what they, they, they couldn't see, they weren't flying. You just move them in, into a new lab a thousand kil kilometers to the east and you go, okay, now which direction should you go? So the original direction is like, okay, I need to go this way. Now you move them and they go, no, I need to go that way. Like they know that they need moved, which suggests that, again, something to do with their visual system um, allows them to detect that east-west movement and not just the direction in which north is. Anyway, it's really, it's really fascinating. Their brains are designed completely differently than ours. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so the reason why I asked is one of the problems, limitations is how much of a backpack can you put on a bird? And I was wondering if magnetic fields would allow you to put a smaller backpack or that's all. Yeah, I think the, the, main, uh, the main problem with the backpacks is battery power. Um, because with things like geolocators, they need to be on 24 seven, or you can program them, I think, to turn off at night if you don't, um, if you don't want night locations just to save some power. Uh, so it's really the size of the battery, um, which determines the weight of the device. And so if you want to track really small birds, you, you have to, you know, get, you, often the battery will not last a whole year, or uh, you need other tricks to, to try to get the battery to last a long time. For bigger birds, they they've actually adding adding different kinds of um, detection devices. One of them, one of my favorite examples is um, a European swift. I forget the species where they were using geolocators, um, but they also built in a detector to see if the bird was horizontal or vertical. So not only was it picking up light, but it could tell you know um, what position the bird was in. And of course, chimney swifts sleep vertical, right? They hang on to something and they sleep vertical. Uh, these chimney swifts that migrated from Northern Europe down to Africa uh, never landed anywhere. For months and months at a time, they were level, meaning that they were in flight. And um, they fly while they're, they sleep while they're flying, which is just again, from a human perspective, you go, wow, that's impossible because I can't do that. <laughs> well, well, birds can. I mean, there's lots of examples in, right now with swifts. Uh, of months long flights where they just never land, um, which is really, you know, to us remarkable only because we were not not really able to observe or document that before now. So yeah, a lot of the, you can build in a lot of different fancy devices. So some people have put in heart rate monitors and various other things, but all of that adds weight. So you need a bigger bird to work with. Thanks for, for that. You're welcome. Uh, somebody has asked what would a, a shift in magnetic field mean for birds? I think you're referring to historical shifts where, you know, again, when planet Earth, the magnetic fields do these weird flip flops over, you know, millions of years. Um, well, birds have been around for flying pretty darn well for at least 60 million years. Uh, I can't remember when the last flip in magnetic fields happened. I'm guessing it might have been more recently than that. So I guess, uh, not trying to sound evasive, but I'm, I'm guessing that at least in the short run, uh, I don't know how quickly these uh, shifts in magnetic fields happen, whether it's in a matter of tens of years or hundreds of years or thousands of years. Uh, it's a good question. I wish I knew more about the, the magnetic field stuff, but if, it was, it was, if it's relatively gradual, you would expect birds to be able to track that. I mean, we had birds before the last ice age that didn't kill them off, right? We had a mile of ice above Toronto. Um, you know, bird, oh, generation by generation, birds can adapt to changes in the environment. And I presume they could do the same with magnetic fields. If anybody knows more about magnetic fields than I do, please chip in. <laughs> uh, 
Bridget, this is Donata. I, I think that's the end of the questions now. I just wanted to give you a huge warm thank you uh, for this wonderful presentation. It's absolutely amazing and uh, sobering, but so informative. So thank you so, so very much.